Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Rotem, and today we'll practice together a technique called stretto fuga and see what awesome things Claudio Monteverdi did with it. In our episode, How to Improvise Polyphony in Four Voices According to Tomas de Santa Maria, we show the technique of inventing imitations that is called stretto fuga. In this episode, we will have a second look at this technique and see how to use it for creating actual music at the keyboard. In addition, we'll see how Claudio Monteverdi used it in his epic Vespers from 1610. Let's start. The term fuga refers generally to successive appearances of a certain subject in different voices. The term stretto fuga refers specifically to a case where the appearance or appearances of a subject occurs immediately, while the first subject is still playing. For this to work, and according to the kind of imitation, at the fifth, fourth, octave, above or below, one must follow a set of rather strict rules. For example, in our other episode on the subject, we demonstrated how in an imitation at a fifth above, the first voice has five options. Stay in place, ascend a third, ascend a fifth, descend a second, or descend a fourth. If these rules are kept, the result will be contrapuntly correct. By the way, Peter Schubert and I prepared a little PDF with all the rules for those of you who want to practice singing or playing imitations. Check it out. Zarlino claimed that the rules of what we call stretto fuga are so restrictive that they are bound to yield the same stock canons over and over again. He wrote, Nowadays, a fuga is not to be found that has not been used thousands and thousands of times by various composers. Thus, he suggests that their use be sparing, so that we do not fall into the clichés found in every book of music. Nonetheless, as the scholar who coined the term stretto fuga, John Milsom, remarked, this technique is fundamental to musical thought in the 15th and 16th centuries, to the extent that it can be located in the works of most, and perhaps even all, composers of polyphony from at least Dufay to at least Monteverdi. I would add that it is found also in 18th century music and even 19th century. Moreover, there are sources that suggest that such techniques were taught and practiced in improvisation, making it really the bread and butter of musicians, performers and composers alike. In this episode, we will focus solely on stretto fuga at the fifth above, and as promised by the title of the episode, we will use a sequence of only two intervals, a descending fourth, followed by an ascending third. We will call A the voice that starts, and its imitation at the fifth above we will call B. At the end we will put a little cadence. Let's listen. It may be hard to imagine at this point, but this contrapuntal seed, when nurtured properly, can blossom. In the following segment, we will investigate what we can do with this simple framework. There are many possibilities to explore, and one can fill books with various examples of varying possibilities. On this occasion, I will share only a few of them with you. Specifically, these will conform to the musical standards of around 1600, where I feel most at home, and which are playable on a keyboard. Let's start. In order to develop this musically, there are two directions one may take. The first is treating it as a skeletal framework and enriching it by adding ornaments, like this, for example. By ornamenting the same motions differently, the repetitive quality of the sequence may be masked. Let's listen. On this channel we often refer to ornamentation, but mostly in regards to performance practice, 
what performers should add to the written composition according to their taste and ability. Here, for a change, we are talking about compositional ornamentation, which is an essential part of the composition and written out by composers. Another way to cultivate our seed, other than ornamentation, is by adding more voices. One of the typical Renaissance formulas for a stretto fuga in three voices is to start with one voice, have the second voice enter an octave below, and then the third voice a fifth above. With our simple theme, it will look and sound like this. This three-voice stretto fuga might start to seem intimidating. But don't worry, as opposed to Renaissance theorists, we will tell you the secret tricks. Thanks to the fact that this melody is sequential, made up of only two intervals that repeat, at a very early stage, two voices end up constantly moving in parallel motion. So, if we wish to simplify this, we may name our parts as A and B as we did before, and the voice that accompanies the B in thirds, we can call B parallel, or in short, BP. Now, since it's a sequence, all the lines may be extended backwards, and we, as curators, may choose what to leave in. At this point, we should also add that the parts above the lowest one may change octaves at will. For example, here we can take our B an octave higher, and the change is primarily aesthetic. Apropos aesthetics, I will add simple ornaments. Let's listen. So, as you may gather, this can be seen from two different points of view. The first is through the eyes of Renaissance theorists, who will probably see it as three individual lines in imitation, and the second, slightly more simplified, that we'll see only two voices in imitation at the fifth above, and the third voice that merely accompanies the second voice in parallel motion. The second view might have been shared by composers after 1600, when the total equality between the voices started to weaken, and some components acquired specialized functions. The bass, the melody, and even one that merely accompanies the melody in consonances. Regardless of the historical point of view, as you will see, labeling our main voices versus those that merely accompany them will prove useful. If we go back to our seed and apply accompanying voices to both voices, we get this model. A accompanied by A parallel, and B accompanied by B parallel. The voices fit with one another so nicely, almost like the figures in a drawing by Escher. Now, if we curate our model a little bit, we might get something like this. Those who will try to analyze it might get a bit confused. They might see it as a four-voice stretto fuga. Well, it's that, but also a simple extension of our two-voice seed, with the lines accompanied by thirds. The art is to organize the material in a nice way. By the way, we don't always have to add and make things more complicated. For example, we can use only the A together with B parallel as a duo, as in this example with some ornaments. This can be analyzed as an imitation at the seventh above, but you now know that it may be seen also as an extension of our seed. Now, after we had fun at the harpsichord, let's see how Monteverdi used this formula in his Vespers from 1610. Monteverdi's Vespers overflow with instances of stretto fuga. It's really exciting to explore what Monteverdi could do with it. Here is one section from his Dixit Dominus. Let's listen.
The first thing we can notice is that Monteverdi renders the subject in a triple meter and fills all the lips with steps. Now let's see exactly how we set it up using six parts. It starts with a typical three voice stretto fuga, down an octave and up a fifth. However, it might be useful to see it from the perspective of our two voice seed model. The A and the B are found in the lowest parts. We should mention that such long sequences were viewed with disdain during the 16th century, but were quite common after the turn of the 17th century. This is just to say that even when composers use an old idiom such as the stretto fuga, they render it differently in accordance with their own style. As you see, towards the end, the B seems to quit the sequential pattern, but actually it is taken over by the voice above it. This trick gives the illusion of a new entry, where actually it's just riding the same sequential wave. The third voice from above takes the B parallel, extending it backwards in the way that we demonstrated before. In the middle, it changes hands when it appears in the top part an octave higher, just after the A parallel has joined. These A parallel and B parallel voice entries from a Renaissance point of view, might be seen as imitations at the octave of our basic A and B. But from our more simplified point of view, they are mere accompaniments of our two basic voices, which Monteverdi placed cleverly. Thanks to this careful setup, the polyphonic experience is rich, surprising, and satisfying. Let's listen again. The next section, on the surface, seems to be very similar, only in a duple meter. However, notice the last bars, where only the A, A parallel and B parallel are used, while the other three voices are just filling in. Let's listen. Until now, we showed how an A and a B may be accompanied by consonances, A parallel and B parallel. And by fiddling around with their placement, one may create really nice things. However, what if I told you that it is possible to develop the material even further? Let's see. Using this particular formula, it is possible to nudge both the A and the B one quarter backwards, creating a groovy syncopation and everything will still work. Here, for example, we have A and B, and the syncopated A an octave above. We will call it AS. And let's add a bit of ornamentation to it. Quite nice. It can be even nicer if we add in also the syncopated B. Amazingly, as in an even more complicated sketch by Escher, all these six components, A and B, A parallel and B parallel, A syncopated and B syncopated, can all work together in six voices. This is just the model. Let's go back to Monteverdi's Vespers to see how it turns into music. In the Gloria section of the Magnificat for six voices, he used it no less than four times, each time a bit differently. Here is how it starts. For your convenience, I will take away the ornamentation, leaving in only the skeletal model. As in the example we saw from the Dixit Dominus, also here, the A, A parallel and the B are taken by the three lowest voices. The third voice from the top takes the syncopated B, 
which in the middle changes levels and moves up an octave to the top part. The second voice takes the B parallel with a little extension at the beginning, and in the middle jumps to the third voice. Lastly, the top part starts with the syncopated A and in the middle jumps an octave higher to the second voice. We should add that due to the length of the sequence, Monteverdi was faced with some musica ficta challenges. In this regard, one necessary evil is the augmented fourth leap found in the second voice from below. Let's listen. Awesome. Monteverdi uses the same techniques throughout the next bits of music, but eventually also brilliantly combines it with the cantus firmus of the piece. Let's listen. This was our episode about Stretto Fuga, we hope you enjoyed it. Notice though that most of the analytical method that we used in this episode is not found in historical sources. It's just another way one may observe things which are in the score. Special thanks to Professor Peter Schubert for helping me write this episode. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you enjoy early music sources, consider supporting it on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.